In a previous video, we looked at copycat gimmicks in wrestling, those which had clearly been ripped off wholesale from another performer. Think of the Renegade in WCW or Fake Razor and Diesel in the WWF for some examples of this. Today though, we are going to look at something slightly different, because while these characters are very similar to the ones which inspired them, we wouldn't call them outright ripoffs. No, these gimmicks may have taken a lot of inspiration from others, however, they ultimately made them their own by putting a unique twist on each character. But who are the biggest examples of this? Well, join us today as we take a deep dive into Accept No Substitutes, Wrestling's Bootleg Gimmicks. And if we're going to start anywhere, we may as well start with one of the most famous examples of this phenomenon, because in the 80s, hoping to capitalize off of the success of the Mighty Road Warriors, WWF would create their own version of them in Demolition. Yes, that's right, even at the time, kids watching could see what Vince McMahon was doing here, as despite having scoured the territory system and poached away pretty much all the top talent North America had to offer during the early part of this decade, there was one team the boss couldn't manage to sign, and that was the Road Warriors. Unfortunately for him though, Hawk and Animal also happened to be arguably the greatest team of all time, a duo who were so over that a special phrase, Road Warrior Pop, had to be created to describe the reaction they got every time they came through the curtain. So resigning himself to the fact that he couldn't woo them over then, McMahon would set about making his own version of the team. Of course, his way of doing this would be to bring together Barry Darso and Bill Eady and rename them Axe and Smash, who came to the ring decked out in leather gear and full face masks. And sure, once they actually started wrestling after that, it was clear they were being portrayed as ass-kicking no-nonsense brawlers, much in the same way Hawk and Animal were elsewhere. That said, Demolition quickly got over with fans. So much so, they'd become three-time WWF Tag Team Champions and eventually added a third member, Crush, to the team. Needless to say then, when the Road Warriors joined up with the company in 1990, it felt like a moment fans had been waiting for had finally come. Sadly though, partially due to health problems Bill Eady was having at the time, these showdowns would never really meet expectations, and so would never make it to pay-per-view. And sure, it also didn't help that when the two teams were stood side by side next to one another, it made it all that much clearer that Demolition were a pale imitation of their opponents. Thankfully though, not all bootleg gimmicks have to be so directly compared to the people who inspired them because by the time Mark Jindrak took up the role of the narcissist in 2004, Lex Luger was already long gone from the roster. But what was this gimmick all about? Well, like the name suggests, in March of 2004, Mark Jindrak would start appearing on SmackDown as a newer, more narcissistic version of himself. And this meant constantly showing off his sculpted abs, flexing his biceps, and just generally being obsessed with his own body. Of course, any fans who'd been watching in the mid-90s would recognize this character right away as being the same one which Lex Luger first used when he joined WWF as a heel. Yes, around the time of the New Generation era beginning, Lex would be regularly brought down to the ring by Bobby Heenan with mirrors in tow, as he showed off his admittedly impressive physique, all to a sea of boos from fans around him. And sure, the gimmick would end up being short-lived for the former WCW World Champion because soon after this, he'd be getting pushed as the new Hulk Hogan, an all-American babyface who stood for everything red, white, and blue. But while this would end up crashing and burning too, it didn't stop WWE from wanting to try his original character out again years later when hoping to give Jindrak the boost they hoped would make him a bona fide main eventer. Unfortunately for the New York native though, despite getting Teddy Long as a manager, he just didn't have the charisma level required to pull it off, and so, after quickly being relegated to B-show velocity, he'd spend some time there milling away and checking out his muscles, all before the whole thing was dropped and he instead moved over to a tag team role with Luther Reigns in September of that year. That's right, even if you don't have the original dare to be directly compared to, being a bootleg version of another gimmick can be incredibly hard to get over as fans no doubt already have a strong idea of what it should be. And if you can't live up to this then, you're screwed. Need more evidence? Then just ask the Berserker, because no matter how hard he tried, he could never be Bruiser Brody. But that was always going to be an impossible mountain to climb because back during the 70s and 80s, there were few more feared men across the territory circuit than the legendary brawler. Hell, so intimidating was he with his wild man look and his 6'8 frame, his co-workers would often be legitimately scared of him, 
as was the case with Lex Luger during a steel cage match between the two in 1987 when, fearing Bruiser was going to shoot on him, Lex would break character by jumping out of the cage and fleeing the arena. So with such a reputation then, it would be nigh on impossible for any bootleg version to compete. And that's just what John Nord found out in 1991 when he signed with WWF and was recast as the Berserker, a similarly ragged-haired wild man figure who clearly took inspiration from the territory star. That said, despite bringing a sword to the ring and often threatening to use it, the Berserker just couldn't match the intimidation level Bruiser Brody was able to evoke. And it didn't help that as time went on, he'd become a far more toned-down cartoon version of the gimmick as, instead of being portrayed as a feared Icelandic warrior, he'd become a bumbling and often clumsy figure. Unsurprisingly then, this didn't get him over with fans, and so by February of 1993, the whole thing would be dropped. And the early 90s would also be the point when another well-known bootleg gimmick of the era would be put out to pasture too. That said, when it came to the Rockers and their Rock and Roll Express-style characters, they were far more successful. Yes, not every imitation in wrestling fails, and nowhere is this more evident than in Shawn Michaels and Marty Jannetty. Of course, the Rock and Roll Express had been so successful in 1980s Jim Crockett promotions that it only made sense someone would eventually try it again. After all, their pairing of two young guys who would fly around the ring like no one else and get the girls excited to watch would quickly become a goldmine for that company during this period. But part of the reason for this was that they had the perfect foils in the Midnight Express. So luckily then, when the Rockers formed in the latter half of the 80s and decided to pick up the mantle, they'd have no shortage of great teams to go up against, because when they joined the WWF in 1988, they'd have a wealth of riches to choose from with teams such as the Brain Busters, the British Bulldogs, and the Hart Foundation. And it was this latter team who perhaps served as the Rockers' greatest rivals then, with the four men involved putting on some great bouts throughout the years which followed. In the end, though, it would be a case of the originals outliving the imitators, because while they had slowed down by the early 90s, the Rock and Roll Express were still going when Shawn Michaels famously threw his partner through the glass window of Bruce Briefcake's barbershop and severed their union once and for all. Maybe another bootleg tag team in a different era would have a better chance of lasting longer then. That's certainly what Bart and Billy Gunn hoped during the new generation, because there, they would take a whole lot of inspiration from the Southern Boys when they formed the Smoking Guns. But let's backtrack a little for a second. Who were the Southern Boys exactly? Well, they were a team made up of Steve, brother of Road Dog Armstrong, and the legendary Tracy Smothers. So being good old Southern Boys in reality then, it only made sense that when they did start pairing up in 1987, they'd play up to this on screen by coming down to the ring in full cowboy regalia, ready and willing to deliver an ass kicking to anyone who deserved it in the manner of the frontier. Of course, for the first few years, this would be a relatively little scene gimmick. That was until they signed with World Championship Wrestling in 1990, of course, as there, they'd suddenly get exposed to a much wider audience. And now on national TV, Armstrong and Smothers would fully shine against the likes of fellow Southerners, the Midnight Express, and the fabulous Freebirds, with each of these feuds helping to establish them to the point that, years later, when looking for a new gimmick to use in mid-90s WWF, Vince McMahon would revisit the whole thing. So that was what led to Bart and Billy aping the former duo in far more cartoonish fashion when they started coming to the ring acting as sheriffs from the Old West, complete with 10-gallon hats, crop duster jackets, and six-shooter guns. Then, once the bell rang, they'd use their old frontier style of justice on any opponents they came up against, usually by pounding on them in much the same way as Armstrong and Smothers might have done over in WCW a few years prior. That said, while this team would find some success, they wouldn't be as fondly remembered by fans as their precursors, because in the years following, Bart would become far more well-known for winning the Brawl for All and then subsequently getting knocked out by Butterbean at WrestleMania 15, and Billy's list of accolades would see him become a member of the New Age Outlaws, D-Generation X, and more recently, Daddy Ass, All Elite Wrestling's resident scissor expert. But it's not surprising his time as a bootleg act to a prior team ended up being less successful than his run during the Attitude Era, because back during the late 90s, wrestling was so popular, it was hard for someone not to get over. And maybe this is why so many performers have chosen to mimic Attitude Era stars in the years following this then, with perhaps no example being more prominent than Abyss's take on Mankind. Yes, for as great as Abyss was in TNA during the 2000s and 2010s, it's hard to argue that he didn't take a fair amount of inspiration from one of Mick Foley's more well-known incarnations, 
After all, there's the mask, the wild appearance, and the psychotic character, all of which come together on both men to create a very memorable image. For Foley, though, he never wanted to be defined by something so one-dimensional. And that was why, after spending a year or so of having Mankind play the Hannibal Lecter-esque villain in the mid-90s WWF, he'd morph into a more unlikely babyface role, turning the once-feared heel into a lovable goof, someone who liked to bring out a sock puppet named Mr. Socko to entertain the audience whenever required. Of course, this isn't to say he couldn't still get incredibly violent when he needed to, as was the case during his Hell in a Cell match with The Undertaker at the 1998 King of the Ring and his brutal I Quit bout against The Rock at the 1999 Royal Rumble. And the diversity in this character would eventually seep into Joseph Park's version too, because after spending the first few years portraying Abyss as a barely controllable, animalistic psychopath who wanted nothing more than to destroy everything and everyone he came up against, a wrinkle would be added to the whole thing when, in 2012, he introduced fans to the supposed brother of the character, also played by Parks. As time went on though, it would become clear that each of these figures were one and the same, and that the man behind the gimmick was having some kind of a psychotic break and eventually this would see him return to being Abyss full-time, just as Foley had always seemed to find his way back to being Mankind in the 90s, even if he would occasionally spend spells wrestling his Cactus Jack or Dude Love in the intervening period. So it just goes to show you then, that if you take the right points of inspiration from another character, your bootleg version can evolve into something else and become great in its own right. Sometimes though, that's not the intention in the first place. Now, sometimes what a person is trying to do is mimic another gimmick for more comedic reasons. And this was exactly what happened when, in the late 2000s, Sharkboy started playing the role of TNA's very own Stone Cold Steve Austin. Now, we shouldn't have to explain to anyone who Steve Austin is, because he's arguably the most popular wrestler of all time. Someone who, when the industry was at the peak of its mainstream success, would be flying the flag as the top anti-authority babyface around in WWF. This then meant he would go on to be an inspiration to many young men and women who were watching at the time, men and women who had dreams of one day becoming an in-ring performer themselves. And few were more taken by the rattlesnake than Dean Roll as it happened. So much so, in fact, that when he made his return to TNA in 2008 after a kayfabe concussion took him out of action, he'd decide to morph the comedy Sharkboy character he'd been playing up until then into something very different. Yes, prior to this, Sharkboy had been a man who wrestled while wearing a shark costume, something initially done so as to capitalize off the popularity of the Discovery Channel Shark Week, and which became so successful he just kept doing it after the fact. That said, by the end of the 2000s, Roll saw an opportunity to go for even bigger laughs when he had Sharkboy recover from his head injury, only to now believe he was stone cold himself. So from there, he'd come out to the ring in a sleeveless vest, giving the finger to everyone in his path, drinking clam juice by the can, and generally presenting himself like the second coming of the trash-talking Texan. But making the whole thing that much more surreal was the fact that he'd continue to wear the shark outfit during this time, leaving fans to wonder what the kayfabe was behind this. Did Austin have a secret sibling who was an actual shark, or had he died and been reincarnated into a shark's body? Either way, it didn't really matter, all that mattered was the whole thing was a bit of fun. And if nothing else, it gave an old Steve Austin fan a chance to live out their dream by getting to play him for a while, albeit in a far stranger manner than had ever been seen in the WWE. And that's not the last Attitude Era inspired gimmick which would come to the forefront in the late 2000s either. Though in the case of Kevin Thorne, he wouldn't take inspiration from the six-time world champion. No, he'd instead base his whole act on WWF's resident vampire of the 90s, Gangrel. That's right, anyone who was watching in the late 90s will remember that, amidst the sea of bizarre gimmicks such as a wrestling pimp and wrestling adult film star, there was a bona fide vampire on the roster, or at least a man who appeared to be playing one. And that's because every time Gangrel came out to the ring, he'd do so through a wave of flames with a chalice of blood in hand, or as JR would put it, viscous red liquid, which he then proceeded to gulp down and spit back into the air. But given how over everything was during the Attitude Era, you could easily get away with something like this. What surprised most people, however, was that the company would try something very similar again when, in June of 2006, as they were reviving the ECW brand for TV, they cast Kevin Thorne as an all-new vampire. Why was this? Well, with the Extreme brand finding a home on the Sci-Fi Network, WWE had been asked to add some science fiction-based characters to the show, 
and this meant that, along with the infamous ECW zombie, there would now be an immortal bloodsucker on the show every week too. Of course, this was supposed to lead to even bigger things, as over time, the plan was for an entire vampire stable to appear on the show, one which included Thorne's valet Ariel, as well as Gangrel himself. Before that could happen though, the whole thing would be scrapped, as it was clear that it wasn't getting over anymore, perhaps because it wasn't exactly in the spirit of the Philly promotion. Yes, if you're doing a bootleg gimmick, it's all about being in the right time and place, something which our next subject also found out the hard way because when Tiger Ali Singh apparently inherited a fortune during the Attitude Era, he'd become something of a modern day million dollar man, albeit without any of the same level of success. That said, it would be hard to match what Ted DiBiase had done in the 80s, because with him having arguably the perfect cartoon villain for the era, a Scrooge McDuck style evil millionaire, he'd act as the perfect foil for the likes of Hulk Hogan and the Ultimate Warrior. But that wasn't the only reason he was pushed to the moon, because with the inspiration for the character being said to be Vince McMahon himself, it's no surprise that the boss fell in love with it the way he did. In fact, so much did he love it that years later, he'd try it again. Though this time things would be updated slightly, as when Tiger Ali Singh took on the role, he was written as someone who'd gotten all his money from his wealthy family. And this would see him do just as DiBiase had done with Virgil years before when he started bringing his own sidekick to the ring named Babu. Then from there, he would steal another page from the Million Dollar Man's playbook when he paid people in the audience to carry out demeaning tasks such as kissing his feet. Not that this would help him once the time came for the bell to ring though, as while DiBiase had the in-ring skills to back his bullying up, Singh was never exactly a maestro between the ropes. So that would see him repeatedly lose to mid-card acts like Viscera and Billy Gunn, with each loss killing his credibility a little bit more. And soon enough, it didn't matter how much money he had because with his inability to pick up a big win, fans lost all interest in him. So this would lead to him disappearing from TV for a while in early 2000, all before returning later that year and being repackaged when he formed a trio with D'Lo Brown and Chaz named Lowdown. In hindsight then, maybe his mistake was not borrowing liberally from the right 80s star, because when Damian Sandow tried to show the unwashed masses how it was done in 2012, he did so with a little bit of inspiration from the genius. Yes, the genius played by Lanny Poffo, the brother of the Macho Man himself, had to be one of the Golden Era's greatest mid-card heels on account of his ability to orate on the mic in a way which made every fan know he was smarter than them and that he wasn't shy about showing it. Of course, this only made it all the much better when, after he'd deliver his latest poem to the live crowd, usually in a manner which insulted them, the baby faces would get their hands on him and make him pay for his words. And perhaps in a sign of how over the genius had gotten with his heel shtick at this point, he'd even get to be part of a feud with Hulk Hogan for a while. So seeing how successful this had been then, Aaron Stevens would later try to revive the whole thing himself in the early 2010s, when he was looking for something to help him get over on the main roster. And that was how he ended up developing the character of Damian Sandow, an arrogant and pretentious heel who was proud of his self-perceived intellect, as in his eyes, it made him better than everyone else around him. Sure, he may not have been delivering poems like Poffo had years before, but the inspirations were still clear for everyone to see, and just like before then, fans would get behind this one too, with it getting Sandow over enough that during the years which followed, he'd form a successful tag team with Cody Rhodes, and at one point, even become Mr. Money in the Bank. But what came after that though, well, it's best left forgotten, because while the payoff to the Damien Sandow character may not have been great, None of this should take away from the fact that it was an example of a bootleg gimmick which worked. And maybe that's the best he could have hoped for from the whole thing then, because when you're doing a riff on someone else, there's only so far you're ever going to be able to go with it. And as everyone in this video had to learn sooner or later, this can be both a blessing and a curse depending on how well you play your cards.